Um, it might be that we start a bit late again for the morning session is Andrea Armour from uh, the University of Nottingham. And uh, the title is Multiphoton and Multimode Josephson Photonics. So please, Andrew, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chipman. And I'd like to start by thanking you and all of the organizers um, for inviting me today and for organizing such a fantastic meeting with so many really stimulating talks this week. So I want to talk about some theoretical work on um, exciting uh, photons and cavity modes using Josephson junction circuits in cases where uh, multiple photons or multiple modes are involved. And this was work done with students Kieran Wood, Grace Morley, but um, the main player was Ben Lang, uh, my postdoc who's with you um, in the room and who spoke on Wednesday. Um, so do grab him at the coffee break if you want to hear more. So I want to start really by taking you back in time to Wednesday morning um, when we heard some really nice talks um, on this system, a voltage-biased Josephson junction coupled either to a microwave cavity supporting multiple modes or just a single lumped element oscillator. And what we heard was that the voltage uh, bias provides an energy which the Cooper pairs can dump into modes of the cavity. And so we can get inelastic tunneling of the Cooper pairs giving rise to DC current, but we can also uh, have excitation of the cavity modes. And there's a very simple model that can be used to describe this system. Uh, if we have several uh, modes, we can just have them as harmonic oscillators. And then the Josephson junction part, we have uh, a Josephson frequency set by the voltage and then essentially the displacement of all of the oscillators with a, a zero point um, fluctuation strength here, uh, which is basically given by uh, the set by the impedance of uh, the mode, the particular mode. And, you know, of course, there are also losses that we have to worry about in this system as well. But one way of looking at it is to think of this as a nonlinear oscillator system. And in that sense, the Josephson energy acts as a control parameter. It controls the strength of this drive, which because of the presence of this term is strongly nonlinear. And so we can think about what happens as we change that parameter, as well as some of the other parameters in the system. And of course, I'm gonna focus on, on this particular system, but there are lots of other uh, systems with Josephson junctions um, in squid geometries, which can be addressed with uh, different types of biases, which would give rise to similar behavior. So this uh, strength of the quantum fluctuations of a particular mode is a really crucial parameter uh, in the system. If it's very small, then these systems, of course, are nonlinear, but the nonlinearity will become apparent at large photon numbers. And this suggests that these systems will behave quite semi-classically. That's not to say that they won't have uh, important quantum properties, but the classical dynamics will be important. And then we can think about maybe the quantum fluctuations on top of that. If delta naught is of order one, uh, and you know, this is something which uh, has been achieved um, in circuits, then that nonlinearity will become apparent at you know, a level of a single photon or less. And so really there won't be a regime where these systems behave linearly. They'll be immediately strongly quantum in their behavior. And I want to focus on the dynamical transitions that these systems can give rise to, down conversion, time translational symmetry breaking. And I want to focus on two particular cases. Firstly, a single mode case with a very large, uh, um, uh, quantum fluctuation strength, like this device that uh, was developed in the Sackley group and Denny, Denny talked about on Wednesday, which they've used to carry out a series of very beautiful experiments, and in particular looking at uh, multi-photon resonances. And so that's the sort of system I'll have in mind, talking about multi-photon resonances. But in other systems, straightforward cavities where there's been no attempt to engineer a very large inductance 
this parameter is very small typically, but these can still be interesting. And in this case, um, there was some very nice progress from Alex Rimberg's group who developed a way of basically inserting a voltage bias uh, into a cavity with some Cooper pair, uh, some Josephson junction device embedded within it in a way that preserved a really high Q. And so these systems uh, are also interesting, but in this case, we have to worry about not just one, uh, but multiple modes uh, in the physics. And I'll talk about those towards the end, depending on how much time is left. So starting with a single mode model, uh, we can think about tuning the voltage and what's going to happen. And so as we tune the voltage, or equivalently the, the Josephson frequency, we will be able to create photons in that mode whenever that frequency matches an integer number of those photons. And so we expect to have particular resonances. And of course, these were seen uh, in the, the Sackley group and indeed um, elsewhere. So um, close to those resonances, we can simplify the Hamiltonian. We can get away from the time dependence by transforming to a rotating frame. So basically the time dependence then sits on the operators here, they start to oscillate. And so we have an oscillation within an oscillation. And so it's perhaps not surprising that there's a way to write this in terms of Bessel functions. And that's this uh, form here, which should be valid close to a resonance where P photons are created. And so we have a creation operator for P photons and annihilation operator for P photons. And then this, this Bessel function part, which looks a bit uh, complicated, but really that's just telling us that once we've the cavity mode is excited uh, and there are photons in it, that will act to affect those creation processes. And there's also normal ordering here, which just tells us that we don't really need to worry about the ordering of the operators in here because it's been predefined with the A daggers all on the left. And writing it this way with the Bessel functions, is actually very helpful if we want to go into a classical description, because we can immediately write this as a classical Hamiltonian with amplitudes instead of operators and Bessel functions here. And of course, all of the classical behavior is um, very strongly rooted in, in Bessel functions. Uh, we can detune it a little bit if we like. The uh, ordering the operators uh, at the beginning gives us this slightly renormalized Josephson energy, depending on the quantum fluctuations. The other thing to note about this Hamiltonian is that once we're in um, the rotating frame, and we've also uh, dropped terms that aren't resonant, making a rotating wave approximation, we have a, a Hamiltonian which now has a rotational symmetry. And we'll see that uh, is important later on. We can take that Hamiltonian and combine it with dissipative terms to write down uh, a master equation for the system. And that gives us a description, uh, a theoretical description of the quantum dynamics. So why bother with, you know, going up in P with this system? So, you know, set processes where single photons are created or two photons are created. These occur across a wide area of physics and, you know, quantum optics textbooks are full of these things, but they don't talk about processes where six photons are created. Those are really quite hard to find. And it's really exciting, uh, as we heard on Wednesday, that you, know, you can actually get this to work and generate these packets of six photons, uh, up to six photons at a time, uh, as the Sackley group did in collaboration uh, with the Ulm group um, and uh, in, published in this recent paper. So, you know, but what, what's interesting perhaps beyond the fact that you know, it's just a really exciting thing to be doing, it's a novel thing to be doing, what, what might we, we get from theory that would point to interesting features going up in P? So the three photon resonance, P equals three, uh, in this and similar systems has actually been explored quite widely uh, recently uh, by different groups, in particular the Ulm group, and we also heard uh, from, from Lisa on Wednesday about this as well, and her analysis uh, of, of this very nice description of what happens in the three photon case. What I want to talk about is what happens when you go beyond three. And our claim is that 
qualitatively new features seem to emerge in the quantum dynamics that make this uh, really worth looking at. So let's start with, with a simpler case, a two photon case. Um, so this is perhaps not very far from the kinds of things that are common in quantum optics. And let's look at, so this is the Hamiltonian in this case, the P equals two case. And let's look at the average number of photons in the steady state of the system as the Josephson energy is increased. And the first thing we can do is carry out a classical analysis. We can turn these operators into amplitudes and solve classical equations of motion. And that's what this thin gray line is here. This tells us that we have a threshold and the system will get excited. And then there'll be another bifurcation and we expect the amplitude to settle down. So that's what the classical system does. It gets excited and that excitation is at a very low photon number typically. It doesn't really uh, need the Bessel function. And so it's this fairly well-known parametric process. We can go beyond that and do something which is semi-classical. We can take the Hamiltonian, the master equation, we can transform it into uh, phase space, look at the dynamics of the Wigner function, but not take all the terms into account. We can, the nonlinear dynamics of the, the uh, uh, and the quantum aspects give rise to higher order derivatives when we do that. But if we drop those and we just describe the system using a Fokker Planck equation, it gives us something which essentially has semi -cla the classical dynamics, but also uh, zero point fluctuations and noise. And that's what this dashed line does for us here. Finally, we can solve the full master equation, and we see that uh, agrees pretty well, but not exactly with the semi-classical analysis in this case. And in particular, that initial sharp classical threshold is smeared out, uh, but it does settle down eventually. And the way the system saturates in the end depends very much on this, uh, the strength of the quantum fluctuations. So if those are weak, then this n value becomes very large. So when you make the quantum fluctuations large, you shrink the phase space of the system. Everything happens at smaller photon numbers. And that's uh, very important uh, for understanding the behavior. So that's the, the two photon case. What about going beyond that? So we heard uh, from Lisa about the three photon case. Here, when you look at the classical analysis, there's no smooth increase, there's a bifurcation and a fixed point appears at a finite amplitude, and then it, it locks in as well. The origin remains stable, but its basin of attraction gets really, really small. And so again, you get fairly good agreement here when you compare the fully quantum and the semi-classical. The other thing to notice is that the photon number has increased. So as you increase P, the phase space grows. Uh, naturally. So the level at which the system settles down gets bigger at higher P. When we go to P equals four, things are really starting to change. And this suggests that there's something interesting that's happening at larger photon numbers. So now there's considerable disagreement uh, between the semi-classical and the quantum case. And indeed, it's not even monotonic. The photon number goes up and then for a little while it goes down again before settling again. And again, as we're increasing the photon, uh, the, the order of the process, the level at which this is happening is, is going to higher photon numbers. So this is the six photon case. And I just want to show you some of the features of this. So this is showing in color here, this is the number distribution. So this is N along here. And the color is the probability in the steady state uh, for finding that number of photons in the system as we change EJ. And again, we've got some classical dynamics as a guide here. And then we've got the average occupation. And what you see is that as EJ is increased, the system starts at the origin, but then it develops uh, some probability to be away from the origin. But then this falters for a while, and the system seems to go back towards the origin before it settles down again, apparently, at a higher amplitude. And we see as this is an oscillation in the average occupation number. So it first increases around the classical bifurcation. It has a second peak later, and then it settles down. We can look at this in the phase space, and these diagrams 
are a little bit busy. They've got classical flow lines and fixed points, but the blue color is just the, the, the Wigner function showing what the system is doing in phase space as we change EJ. And essentially, as we start off uh, down here, the system is around the origin. And then because of the p-fold rotational symmetry in the Hamiltonian, as we go into the bifurcation, the system is spreading out uh, with these six bright points around here. But then as we continue, it goes back again. So we have this oscillation. Uh, so this bifurcation, this dynamical transition is actually very complicated uh, that we're seeing here. If we go a bit further, um, in fact, there, there's a second bifurcation where these six points would actually split into 12. Um, but we can't see that just yet on this, this diagram. So I think the message I want to, to, to convey about this and why I think it's really interesting is that if we look at what happens as we change the quantum fluctuations and we essentially tune the phase space of this system, we don't just increase this effect by making the phase space smaller. So this is a scaled version of the occupation number as a function of EJ on a log scale uh, with different values of the quantum fluctuations. And what we see is that at smaller values, 0.4, there are no oscillations visible. There's nothing happening. As we increase it, we get a series of very sharp oscillations. And this is you know, shrinking the phase space. But if you keep shrinking it, they start to wash out again. They're not quite as clear at these largest values. So what I think is really interesting about these oscillations is that they don't occur just you know, in a strongly quantum few photon limit. Of course, they're washed out in a limit with many, many photons, but they somehow they exist in some mesoscopic regime in between where the photon number is neither too large nor too small. Of course, that makes it very tricky to analyze it as well. So let's go beyond the, the static features and, and talk about some of the dynamics going on in this system. So it's described by a master equation. And the right hand side of that is captured by a Lavillian that acts on the density operator. And the time scales of the system, its dynamical time scales, are all within that Lavillian. And if we calculate the eigenvalues, then we know all about the time scales of the system. Now, what we expect is as that we go towards something uh, that in the classical cases of bifurcation, we may expect to see a slow time scale emerging, uh, a signature of a critical slowing down, essentially. Now, uh, people in the uh, nonlinear dynamics community think about large photon limit where the number of photons is very large, and in that case, you can start to have a, a time scale that doesn't just become very small, it tends towards zero in that limit. And people think of that as then becoming, uh, in some sense, a phase transition. So let me start with an example. And this is um, one of the kind of models that, that David was solving yesterday. This is a two photon process. And in this case, as you increase the effective drive, the system goes from sitting around the origin to suddenly developing a couple of loads, uh, uh, nodes at the side. So they appear uh, in, at a finite amplitude, making it a first order transition, and it breaks the symmetry. And eventually, as you keep going with the driving, they disappear. And if you look at the time scales in the system, as you go through this bifurcation, you get a couple of time scales becoming uh, very slow. And then one of them goes back up and the other stays very slow. And that's really a signature of the fact that you essentially have these two lobes and there's a very slow time scale associated with switching between them. So this is a sort of model that people discuss and it's a relatively simple one with a two photon process. What about going up in photon number? What happens in, in those cases? Well, for P equals three, uh, so N here is the photon number. And then we've got the time scales here on a log scale uh, becoming very slow here. And we've got a time scale that comes down and goes up again around the point that the system gets excited around the bifurcation. And we also have a couple of time scales that go down and they stay down. 
they wiggle a little bit, but essentially this, this fits this paradigm that people have discussed very widely uh, of dynamical transitions. And we would expect that if we could make the phase space bigger, then this would come down further and this would go down further and the thing would look sharper and tend towards something a bit more like a phase transition. But what if we increase P? Well, if we go all the way up to, to P equals six, it gets much more complicated. Of course, if we're looking at the, the behavior of the occupation number, this has got these, these oscillations. And what we see is that we've got several timescales that become very slow, but instead of going down and staying down and one coming back up, these timescales stick together and they have these oscillations. And these oscillations match uh, essentially perfectly what's happening in the photon number. And in fact, they were present back in P equals three, even though we couldn't see any signature uh, in, in the photon number. So really this is telling us that the, the dynamics is, is uh, leading to this, this oscillation. And there are signatures in these time scales, which are much more complicated, the kinds of dynamical transitions seen in, in simpler oscillators. Now, of course, once we have slow time scales, we can uh, simplify the problem and we can start to ask what these eigenvalues mean physically. And I don't want to go into the details, um, but what Ben found was that essentially you can uh, match up the uh, oscillations in the number with oscillations in a time scale, which basically describes um, the rate at which the system goes from one of these points at a large amplitude back uh, towards the origin. But it's a difficult system to describe, and we don't have a fully intuitive description of why these oscillations uh, have arisen, and that, that's something we're uh, still working on. But let me now talk just a little bit about the, the multi-mode case. And this was stimulated by some experiments that were in the Cohenhoven group. And in this case, they took their device and they embedded it in a high-Q cavity uh, using the Rimberg approach to bias the voltage without damaging uh, the Q. So they uh, had the DC voltage bias here. And they looked at the emission from the fundamental mode as a function of the voltage. And they did this then, you know, sweeping up to, you know, levels where the voltage corresponds not just to what you, where you would expect the fundamental mode to be, but of order 10 times that. So this is an enormously high voltage compared to the fundamental frequency. And you might think, well, could this be some 10 photon process? But absolutely not, because the quantum fluctuations here are very, very weak. And the multi-photon processes depend on powers of the quantum fluctuations. So they're very strongly suppressed. But what the system does have is lots of modes, and these have a high Q. And so in this case, there's something going on with the mode. So basically, one mode is becoming excited, and somehow the energy is getting transferred down to the fundamental mode where we're seeing this. Uh, strong emission coming from. And so that raises lots of questions about what happens in these multi-mode systems. And we go back to that initial Hamiltonian, but now we have to, to worry about the, the sum here and the different modes involved. And when we look at this at first sight, we see that, you know, the point is that the, the Joseon junction here couples together all of these modes. And so naively, you might think, well, this is some kind of all-to-all -all coupling, they're all coupled together. So maybe some kind of mean field theory might be appropriate here. But this isn't uh, the case at all because you know, these modes are all oscillating at particular frequencies, which are different. They also have uh, different zero point fluctuation strengths of these. Uh, the way that they get coupled together depends very much on the frequencies and the Joseon frequency itself. So most of the coupling uh, won't be important and it isn't a mean field problem. So to address this, we can think about uh, a simple model in which we excite at some harmonic of the fundamental mode, and we have an ideal dispersion with each of the modes at integer uh, values of the fundamental. We assume a constant damping, and we assume that there's some number of modes that's relevant. Of course, there will be some cutoff in the system, but that will 
uh, be smooth, but just to make life easier, we're going to, to assume that that's a hard cutoff. And this was the kind of model that uh, Ben was talking about on Wednesday, um, but I'm going to look at it from a different point of view in terms of where this transition uh, comes from, how the fundamental mode gets excited. And so the place to start with something this complicated is the classical dynamics. So turning these operators into amplitudes, and we've then got this Hamiltonian and exploring what happens numerically, essentially. And one neat thing to look at is the, the total phase across uh, all of the oscillators. And as you increase uh, the Josen energy, the system goes from oscillating at uh, the drive frequency set by, uh, with a period set by the Josen frequency to the period set by the fundamental mode. So you get, uh, what you get below the threshold is this red curve, uh, which has sort of sawtooth oscillations with period set by the Josephson frequency. And then that period shifts. So the period in the Hamiltonian no longer describes the oscillations uh, above the transition. And this was something that uh, was looked at by Simon and Cooper, who actually found that despite the fact that this is a very complicated problem, you can find uh, an analytic description for this uh, state, this um, sawtooth state that emerges with the period of the fundamental mode, if you make some approximations. What they didn't look at was exactly how this transition occurs and when it occurs. So if we look at this classical dynamics in systems uh, where we now we excite here at a frequency that matches the third harmonic. And we have a system here with 11 modes and another one here with 12 modes. And then we ask what happens basically as we increase the Josephson energy. So initially we have the mode that's resonant with the Josephson frequency excited, but also the, uh, the mode that's at twice that frequency and the one that's at three times that frequency also gets excited as well. And then we have an abrupt transition where all the modes get excited, including the fundamental. And in this case, it's a continuous transition with the amplitude of the fundamental mode growing continuously. But if we change the number of modes, then it's no longer uh, a continuous transition. It becomes discontinuous. There's a sudden jump. And what you see is that in fact, it's suppressed. This transition occurs quite a lot later in this case. Now, if we want to try and analyze when these occur, this discontinuous transition is very difficult because we don't really know where it's going to settle down to. This case where the transition is continuous is much easier because all we have to do is find out where this state where most of the modes are not oscillating becomes unstable. And so that's something that we can seek to address. What we do need to know is what the amplitudes are, what the fixed points are for these modes that get excited early on. So there's some small subset of the modes that will get excited without a threshold. And we need to know what their amplitudes are, but we know that the other modes start from zero. And so that makes locating this transition feasible. And so that's something that we've, we've worked on a bit. So these continuous transitions, when they can occur, occur at relatively low EJ compared to the discontinuous ones because they, they boil down to relatively low order processing. Uh, and those are favored when the quantum fluctuations are weak. We can analyze this by thinking about a certain set of modes which are excited, the resonant mode and the harmonics of that, and modes that aren't excited at all. And we can, again, use the rotating wave approximation and what we see is that the, the modes that are not excited initially fall into different subspaces. So for example, here we've got uh, 13 modes and we're exciting in resonance with the seventh one. And there's a, a subspace involving one, two, three, four of the modes. And that subspace is where the excitation starts at the transition in this case. So in fact, not all of the modes necessarily go at once at these transitions. They split into subspaces. And um, we can, if we know what the behavior of the 
modes that get excited is then we can use that to figure out where this transition is going to occur. And it turns out that you can actually uh, analyze the problem to find these six points, even when there are several excited modes quite efficiently. And that's something that Ben and Kieran uh, looked at. So just to, to finish off, I just want to show you some uh, results for the critical coupling as a function of the number of modes. For cases where we excite uh, the mode that's at twice the fundamental frequency and the mode that's at three times the fundamental frequency. And the points here are plotted where there's a continuous transition and where we can uh, figure this out using this stability analysis. The region here is marking where discontinuous transitions occur and we have to work hard go looking for exactly where these happen. So for example here, uh, with n equals eight here, eight modes where we're exciting the mode with frequency uh, three times the fundamental, we have a, a transition here. Um, but if we remove one of the modes, then we have instead a discontinuous transition and it doesn't occur until a stronger coupling. So as we're adding modes, there are particular values that reduce the transition, that facilitate it, and these are basically given by an integer times the uh, mode number that we're driving minus one. And one way of thinking about what's happening, why these are special, is that as we add one of these modes uh, here, we can then excite that and the fundamental using the drive, but also photons from the residently excited system. And so in terms of the unexcited modes, these uh, as we get to one of these values, uh, which is special, we uh, can facilitate the transition because we turn on processes where we can draw energy from the resonantly excited mode and um, basically use that to, to facilitate a lower order process than the unexcited modes. Okay, so I think my time is running out. So I just want to leave you with my conclusions. I think these higher order processes are really exciting. Um, they don't happen very often. And I think you know, there's um, some evidence that they're really doing things that are interesting, something in between very low and very high photon numbers uh, where quantum effects are still important, uh, which is unusual. And we're looking for an intuitive picture of that. Um, we're also pursuing uh, this multi-mode problem. And as you heard, on Wednesday from Ben, one of the issues there is looking at uh, basically what the quantum fluctuations are, what the entanglement is. Uh, in particular, Ben spoke about that below the threshold. Uh, but I'd like to stop now and, and thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, Andrew. So uh, the floor is open for questions. Probably. <clears throat> Hey, Fabian Hassler here. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, I have actually a question to the first part and one to the second. So to the first part, it's like um, you introduced this um, delta as the coupling strength. Yeah. Did you think about going to very large delta, at least in the theoretical analysis, because something special happens um, for delta equal one? And the second question is like, um, it seems in the second part, everything seems to be depend on this cutoff n. Yeah? Have you been thinking about making the cutoff a bit a softer? Okay, so the, the first question, I think, yes. I mean, the, if you, so the delta parameter is key, absolutely. And I think, um, but, and, you know, we've seen, of course, for, from Denis that you can have this parameter of order unity. And that really does suppress the phase space. And if you continue making it smaller, um, then yes, the phase space gets smaller. But you know, these are processes that, because they're six photon processes, kind of require a certain size to work properly. And so I think you know, what I would argue is that if you make delta too large, then you, you, things actually become less interesting again in this case. So the, you know, these oscillations, I think they're, they're most sharply defined and you can worry about what the spacing is at a value that's below one. As you start to, to go higher, uh, 
you know, the first one is still there, the second one's barely there, and you wouldn't think that there was a sequence of them. And, you know, as you increase delta even further, you're really pushing this phase space down. And so it doesn't, you know, the, the, these features, I think, are damaged, actually, in that limit. In terms of the um, uh, multi-mode problem with the sharp cutoff, yes, I think, absolutely, I think a smooth cutoff is, is certainly uh, um, more realistic. But I think, you know, it, it, this is quite a nice place to start. And I, it's complicated enough. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's a nice way to try and understand what these modes are actually doing. And then when you introduce a smooth cutoff, you know, those features will, will get uh, washed out. So for example, you know, one thing we have done is increase um, the damping uh, with mode number. That's one way to implement the cutoff. And what you find, of course, then is that basically as you keep adding modes, at some point it makes no difference uh, because those modes are highly damped. So yes, that, that's a, an important thing to do. But I think it's still, it's quite fun to look at this uh, in the slightly simpler case with the sharp cutoff uh, and just see what's happening with these additional modes. Okay. So. Okay, thank you. A nice talk. I have a short question related to the second part, to the multi-mode. Do you think that you can understand all your, I mean, results in terms of Floquet theory? I mean, all the multi-mode structure that emerge is, I mean, contain or could be explained in terms of Floquet multi-mode, I mean, uh, resonances? You have a driven I system, I mean, and your structures seems to me that, I mean, it looks like the one that you can obtain from the Floquet. Structure. Yes, that, that, that's a very interesting point. Uh, yes, I think that, that would be um, uh, a good thing to do. I mean, I think, I mean, at the moment, you know, our main focus was really on trying to understand, you know, where these transitions occur. And so these, most of the modes aren't oscillating. And so that's, that's not a problem. And then what you have to do is find what the state of these excited modes are. And um, we, did, we did find a way to do that, but we haven't, haven't used the Flocke approach. Um, if you, you know, what we try and do is, is with the rotating wave approximation, just, just make essentially the simplest um, analysis where we, the, the time drops out for, for analyzing those fixed points. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, for the nice, uh, nice presentation. I would very much like to discuss many of these issues with you. As you know, um, there is one, uh, say, speculative question. Do we learn something when we consider the limit where the whole system uh, tends towards a field theory? So, so considering the limit where, where uh, you consider a field theory, do you think we learn something from this limit, which can uh, be, say, provide more input or other perspective than what you have shown? Yes, I think so. I mean, that isn't something I've tried to do, but I think, I mean, I think the, the field theory limit would be interesting. And I think, I mean, more generally, I think these systems, you know, they, they give rise to potentially very interesting nonlinear theory, field theories. Um, so yes, I think that, that would be interesting. Sorry, maybe I can ask a quick uh, question. About these oscillations, is there a correlation where I could see them in particular uh, in a stronger way? Is it the spectrum or uh, some other correlation in the system for the first part? Well, these, I mean, these oscillations are, are there present at a very basic level in, in, in you know, the, the most obvious um, observable, the, the average occupation number in the system. Sure, that's right? striking. So system is, you know, so you don't really need to go to something more complicated. The system is, you know, you know, classically, you know, there's a bifurcation, but it doesn't tell you where the system is going to be. 
And what we see is that quantum mechanically, the system really takes a long time to decide where it wants to be. And essentially it goes backwards and forwards. And that's, um, so it's present really just at the occupation number level without going beyond that. I mean, of course you can look at more complicated features as well. Okay, thank you. Good, are there more questions? I think not. And let's thank uh, Andrew again.